And we've got a panel with three people who are eminently qualified to talk about this particular question. The first is Neil Chilson, who's a uh, senior research fellow in technology and innovation at the Charles Koch Institute and the former acting chief technologist at the FTC. Uh, next to him is Matt Stoller of the Open Markets Institute, um, where he is a fellow and the author of the forthcoming book, Goliath, The Hundred-Year War Between Monopoly Power and Populism. Uh, and on the right is Heather West, who's a senior policy manager and head of America's policy at Mozilla. Uh, so, Neil, let's start with you. Uh, is the era of freedom over? <laughs> no. <laughs> Is it on now? I'm, I'm red, green, colorblind, so a red and a green light, not great. Um, no, the era of freedom is not over uh, on the internet or generally. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I really do like the framing of this panel. Thanks so much to uh, Lincoln uh, for having me. Uh, the cathedral versus the bazaar. Uh, you know, I'm a computer scientist before I was a lawyer, and I spent a lot of time thinking about op open source and all the issues around open source and IP. Uh, were the reasons that I went to law school, because all the people who are doing cool work um, uh, were, were working in that space. Um, Larry Lessig's book, uh, Code as Law, is probably the, the, the book that raises this issue the most. And I would say that's, that book is the reason I went to law school. And so, um, I, you know, and the, the idea around the cathedral and the bazaar is this, is, it's, an, it's about open source development. It's about development. Um, is, can we do, uh, can we build code? Can we build complicated systems uh, where there is no design ahead of time, but where there's a sort of general plan and then we don't, we just let autonomous people work on pieces of it themselves. Uh, the writer of that book, uh, The Cathedral and the Bazaar, is, is quite skeptical of that initially, but he decides to try it out after he sees the success of Linux. And he finds out that rather than a cathedral design for software, where you have uh, you know, the, the old waterfall model, which is uh, design everything up front and then step by step go through the process, uh, he finds that it, it worked pretty well for the function that he was working on. Now, he has a lot of conditions around when it can work well and when it might not. Um, and it's a really interesting read. And I think it's a really good uh, analog, I think, to some of the debates around wall, walled gardens. Now, Cathedral versus the Bazaar was really about software development, so it's not really talking about uh, markets exactly. Uh, it's not really talking about products as they exist uh, out there for consumers, um, but it, it provides a, a nice uh, metaphor. And the walled garden idea, um, like built on the sort of open source idea that we could do complicated things in emergent ways without top-down design, uh, to say, well, we might have different ways of products in the world, software products. I think the best example, or I think the, the paradigmatic example of walled garden versus uh, a more open network would be uh, how ISP, ISPs used to differ, right? So if you had AOL or Prodigy um, or uh, CompuServe, I don't know if any of you, you probably recognize AOL, but you may not recognize uh, some of the other ones, you were getting onto the internet in a very curated form. You basically logged into Prodigy or AOL, um, and and you saw your you saw their version of the internet for you, right? They had a lot of content. They had a front page. Sometimes you could go off and do other things, but you used the chat programs that they had, and their version of the internet, and that was a walled garden model. Uh, contrast that with the cable broadband model, uh, which was basically you logged in and then you didn't end up. You might end up on like Comcast you know, like web page, home page, but then you could run any applications you wanted on your computer. You could do whatever you wanted. Um, you could browse the web or you could install some different chat program. And that was the more open model. Uh, and I think throughout history in, of technology, we've seen the, the switch between those modes uh, in technology constantly. And what the way we've often seen it is that a company will de design a very good walled garden that brings a lot of uh, people in but then the early adopters are out there doing the harder thing, the weirder thing, the newer thing, um, and they're trying out something that's less user friendly, but gives them more uh, flexibility and more freedom. And so, and that's where the new emergent competitor to that walled garden would happen. So, Lessig in his book, uh, you know, Code is, is Law, um, his big bad guy of that time was AOL. AOL clearly uh, kind of got sunk 
by uh, the, the more open models that were out there. And so that, that kind of set up the idea of how can walled gardens and more open models compete. Uh, I think we've seen that over and over and over in technology. Uh, Tim Wu has a, uh, well, I'll say three-fourths of a good book on this, um, where he really lays out the history of the, the shift between walled garden technologies and more open technologies. Um, and he talks about them in the, is in, in the sort of market dynamics that happen there um, and, and how it keeps happening over and over, how the walled garden gets built up and then some new uh, competitor comes out of nowhere and, and just totally makes that, that walled garden ir uh, irrelevant. Um, his prescriptions I, I disagree with largely. I think he, he doesn't really quite diagnose the problem correctly. And his prescriptions are essentially, uh, even though he has, he has a great quote, which maybe I'll get around to reading it later, but uh, where he talks about how government contributed to the building of these walled gardens. And apologies to the host, his, his paradigmatic example is AT&T throughout that book. Um, and he talks about, uh, uh, about the role of government in maintaining the walled garden of AT&T, where you had to rent your phone from the company, you couldn't buy your own equipment. And so, um, uh, so but even though he acknowledges that, he basically, his solution is that we need the government better. Uh, and and he doesn't really acknowledge uh, the the sort of rent seeking problem that's that's there, uh, and that that might be the cause and the perpetuator of walled gardens rather than the solution to them. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I think this is a great discussion. Thanks. I'm happy to be here, and I look forward to the talk. So after Neil's uh, rather sanguine take of inevitable cycles, Matt, do you have any cold water you'd like to throw? Um. Thanks. Uh, just to, to say, I really enjoyed Larry Lessig's book, um, Code. But um, but uh, now that I know that it he <laughs> it drove it's me to responsible lie. for I'm, I retroactively and going and I'm enjoying it less. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so I'm going to read a couple of quotes, and uh, I have I have certainly many thoughts. Um, on kind of openness versus closeness, but I we think a lot about markets and market structure, and um, you could go back to the 1790s development of the post office, and there have been these debates about the nature of of um, neutral public protocols or privatized protocols, and I'm sure we will go back into some of that. But I'm going to start with a quote by uh, Harry Truman's economic advisor, who's a guy named Leon Kieserling. Um, the first head of the Council of Economic Advisors when it was created right after World War II. The realm of science and its application to technology is expanding at a startling pace, and its limits are beyond calculation. The advances of the future can be made to serve the common welfare by affording opportunities for initiative and enterprise, or they can contribute increasingly to the growth of private monopoly. Um, OK, so today I'm going to relatively recently, Mark Zuckerberg had a different quote where he said, in many ways, Facebook is more uh, like a like a government than a than a company. We're really setting policies. So there was a recognition in Truman's era, and really up until the 1960s and 70s, that private monopolies that set terms and conditions for whatever kind of markets you're talking about, be they software markets, be they steel markets, uh, were private governments, and um, and uh, that the role of d democratic institutions was to open those up so that everyone could participate in them. And that innovation itself was another way of talking, this is another name for what we also call political liberty. So uh, I have a whole bunch of uh, antitrust cases that were existing in 1952. I found them in a, there was a special subcommittee on investigations of monopoly power and uh, they were just all sitting out there, like just this whole list of about, about 100, 150 cases. We haven't had a Section 2 case in 20 years, but they had cases just on patents and know-how on everything from fluorescent lamps to argon gas to um, latex to braking systems, chlorinating equipment. My favorite one here is um, telescope grocery carts, those things that you... Um, and... Uh, machine tools, aluminum coil slats for Venetian blinds, but also electrical equipment, soap and synthetic detergents. Um, just up and down the economy, you had antitrust suits to break down the use of patents and knowledge monopolies to control innovation. 
That was policy in the 1950s and 60s and 40s under both Republican and Democratic administrations up until the 70s. And I want to um, talk about the most important suits here. So 1950s, the DOJ had a suit against AT&T. AT&T has been broken up three times in the 20th century, 1913, 1956, and uh, 1982. In 1956, one of the other things they did uh, is they said, uh, the Eisenhower administration said that Bell Labs had to license its patents on a non-discriminatory basis to all comers. Uh, also said the phone company could not expand outside of the telecommunications realm where it had um, a monopoly. So some of those inventions were um, the electronic transistor, the solar cell, the laser. And um, that consent decree alone was responsible for 1.3% of, of all unexpired US patents becoming freely available, like of all patents. And what we found um, was that in the, this is to some scholars who wrote a paper on it, in the first five years alone, the number of patents increased by 25% in fields with compulsory license patents compared to similar fields without it and continued to increase. And these were largely in small companies, new companies outside the telecommunications field. Now, why is this relevant to the cathedral and, and the bazaar? Well, there was also a case against RCA, which would dominated the television and radio production industries. And there was a case against IBM, which dominated uh, punch cards. And um, eventually a later one on, on uh, their control of, of um, computing. So um, all of these suits were done with the same theme and the same policy objective in mind. And that was what Leon Kayserling said, which was to open up the electronic century for all comers, not just in America, but allies in Japan, allies in Europe, um, all over the world. And it worked. Um, so Alfred Chandler, who's a great historian, business historian, he, in his last book, which was um, The Electronic Century in 2000, he called antitrust officials the gods of creation. Um, because he said they were, they were uh, and he, it, not, not in the Christian sense, but in sort of the Greek sense of, of the, the tricksters who kind of unleashed energy. Um, so that's, that was how we used to think about the world up until the, really the late 1970s. Now, from the 1980s onward until kind of today, you've seen this gradual transition into this other way of thinking about political economy and innovation. Um, and that is rather than opening up standards for everybody or opening up markets so that more people could compete, it's been about this sort of the Schumpeterian idea of, of controlling, of fighting for control over standards or controlling markets, not so, you know, the, the um, I'm sure you have the, the quote on you, but instead of fighting within markets, you're fighting over markets. And that's how we redefined competition. So a lot of the standards that were developed prior to the 1980s, we think of them as sort of modern internet things, but they were actually developed, um, TCP IP, software, email. Um, those were pre-1980 um, technologies. And in the 1980s, you started to see the development of these of sort of privatizing protocols like operating systems, microchips. Um, and you saw this sort of gradual transition as these different technologies uh, that were had been based on openness were kind of increasingly foreclosed. Uh, until really the 1990s and 2000s when you're seeing the development of whole new generations of technologies that were never open in the first place. These are things I guess you could probably look at, at social networking, which could just be a public protocol, but is a company that we call Facebook that controls the major communication networks. And so now we're in a weird moment when we have monopolies that are dominating. Some of them are use open source software, but they're, they're monopolies. They're controlling our right to innovate, to build things, to tinker, to um, act as citizens and producers, to build businesses, and you're seeing declines in business formation and all sorts of other problems. And you're also seeing a lot of problems within these highly, highly centralized networks. So I guess if I were to say, uh, to answer the question that you asked, Neil, is uh, are we still free? Um, I think that's a really uh, important open question because Mark Zuckerberg seems to think that he governs the social networking space. And I, I don't think I voted for him. And I'm pretty sure no one else in this room did either. Now, Heather, uh, you're in a position to talk about how these issues of openness and its opposite are playing out in the real world of policy. So uh, what are some of the different 
paths forward as they appear to you? Sure. Um, on? Yes. Okay. Um, mine doesn't have any colors, <laughs> which is kind of problematic. Um, so I'm in the weird, potential, potentially weird position of agreeing with Matt and Neil. Um, and I think that this is actually a very important debate. So um, Mozilla... Uh, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, so we'll see. Uh, so, so we're, Mozilla. We're actually the same person. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it, it all really becomes weird. clear. Um, <laughs> Mozilla is you can you can trace Mozilla as a company back and to either 1998 or 2003, um, but either way, Mozilla is a company that was created. Um, oddly, out of a walled garden. So AOL spun Mozilla out um, and gave us our initial funding, gave us our initial employees and some corporate structure um, for us to create this competitor in some ways. Um, and the whole mission of Mozilla kind of boils down to this idea that we need to be creating competition online. We, we are very dedicated to open source, so I, I really hope it's not dead. Um, all of our products are open source. Um, we have acquired some products that we are slowly open sourcing as we kind of clean things up and really figure out how to do that in, a, in the best possible way. Um, the best example of that is Pocket. Uh, if anyone uses Pocket, we own Pocket. Um, and we, we've open sourced the mobile app. Uh, we're working on some other things. Um, and But I, one of the reasons that I really love the framing of this panel is cathedrals are great and bazaars are great, and they both have an important role here. I think, you know, you can love or hate Facebook, but that's probably never going to come out of an open source effort. On the other hand, all of these incredibly important standards, uh, whether you're talking about encryption, whether you're talking about these underlying uh, protocols online, they are all critical to creating something like Facebook, like Google, um, that have incredible you know, consumer value. Um, but then we have to stop, step back and say, look, what is the actual values that we want to imbue on this tool? Um, are, we, are we talking about technology as this monolith in the corner that policy shouldn't pay attention to? That's probably, that era is over. Um, I used to call it techno-libertarian optimism. Um, and I think that we're a little bit more skeptical. We're entering this new era where we are thinking about these tools as tools um, and as things that can be abused, as we have all kind of seen, whether that's bullying online, whether that's election uh, manipulation, whether that is bias in automated decision making, there's a lot of questions that we are having to come to terms with and think about the actual policy of. Um, and one instinct when we're thinking about that is to say, oh no, open is scary. Like that means that anyone can, can write this code. Um, and then the flip side is, well, if it's open, then I know what it says and I know how it works. Um, I think that, that this new world of skepticism, um, we're going to have to come to terms with the fact that we want these technologies to be decentralized and these standards to be decentralized, but we also want someone to be able to exert some control over them and, and think about how they are interacting with our lives, with society, and, and really the impact on all of us, whether that we're talking about me the person or the, the broader questions um, that society, government, regulation are, are thinking about and grappling with at the moment. Uh, so Neil, for all the jokes about the transitive property, uh, do you think that there's room for common ground uh, with Matt and his side based on what you've heard and what you think? Uh, yeah, I mean, all it would take would be for Matt to agree with me and then <laughs> then we'd have it solved. Um, I, I do think there's room for common ground. I think uh, I think uh, I heard you uh, say something in the, the the back room, and I hope it wasn't uh, we weren't off the record exactly there. But you basically said, you know, you're for distributing power. You're for distributing, uh, you know, un unauthorized that, that power. That was I think. private. That was, that was between us. <laughs> it's out there now. I, I hope you haven't. I think you've said things like that in public before. So uh, I, I think on that, I, I think. Um, I think I agree with that a lot. The problem is uh, if you're using power to distribute power, there's an inherent problem there, right? Like you're having to centralize power in order to distribute power. And if that's your solution, that's very challenging. You're, you're saying we're going to put hands 
the power in X hands instead of Y hands. And there's lots of reasons why we might do that in lots of different ways. I, I did find it particularly instructive that you focused a lot of your comments around patents, which are a government-granted monopoly by their nature. That is their purpose. And, and, and to point to them and say that they create monopoly problems is kind of saying they're doing what they're supposed to do. That's what they do. And, and AT&T similarly was a, uh, basically a government-granted, heavily regulated entity uh, uh, as a monopoly for a really long time until, until uh, we started to apply some of the lessons uh, and we started to see the technology was, was outstripping their ability um, to, to keep up. And, and we decided, hey, it didn't make any sense to do that anymore. And so, um, you know, I, I, do think, uh, I do think there's room for common ground. I think inappropriately concentrated power is risky. Um, but I think there are lots of ways to get at it, uh, to get at that challenge. And the history of technology is that the best way to get at that challenge is for the next guy to come and beat the pants off of the previous guy. And that's happened over and over and over. And I do want to point out the, the slight difference. I, I'm totally with, with Heather. I think I agree more with her slightly uh, than, than with Matt, that both of these models are constant across technology. You have to have centralized design for certain types of products. And distributed design makes a ton of sense for other types of projects or open protocols. Uh, you said, you know, Facebook could just be a protocol. No, it can't. It's, it's a huge number of servers that are expensive and bandwidth and, and employees to content moderate and all of that stuff. Like, it's not just a protocol. It's a company for a reason because it's really expensive to provide the service that they have. And so to just saying that it's a protocol, yes, there is a protocol involved. We could open that protocol. That would not mean that other people could be what Facebook was. Um, and, and, and so I think we need to distinguish where it makes sense to have design, control, uh, and, and a, a firm to do that, and where it makes sense to have distri distribution and openness in a way that allows lots of people to get together and communicate. And I think the tech sector has moved back and forth between those poles for a long time. I'd note walled gardens, the very metaphor, uh, there's gates in gardens, and most of the technologies that we would call walled gardens, even now, have lots of gates into them, and, uh, and there's ways to, to move information between the services. And I think that trend will continue, um, uh, and I'm not sure that, uh, that we have good ways to measure, uh, to, pr to do that better than the way that we're doing it now. So Matt, how does that sound to you? Are we struck with just letting trends play out naturally? Well, I think there's just, there's basically the, the, you know, this is sort of a philosophical debate about how you think human society operates. And this, you go back hundreds of years about on this. Uh, so, you know, we, we had this debate in 1912 between um, new, new nationalists and Teddy Roosevelt and the new freedom types of Woodrow Wilson, and then there was there was William Howard Taft, who was a little bit of an anti-monopolist, but mostly uh, kind of a conservative type. And then there was Eugene Debs, and that was that was embarrassing. But um, uh, but the philosophical debate was. By the way, thank you for laughing at the Debs joke. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, the idea behind um, that both Roosevelt and Debs thought was that monopoly and big business and these these technology has a life of its own, right? Technology just develops. It's a sort of quasi-Marxist view of inevitabilism. It came from some German historians and they called it scientific history. And uh, Taft, uh, uh, Roosevelt, Taft thought, well, you know, he also kind of agreed with that theory too. And his view was, well, if, if big business develops um, kind of naturally, then the people that run it are the ones who are good at running it, so let them run it. And we'll have private masters who know what they're doing. Teddy Roosevelt's view was, and sort of Eugene Debs, were, was, well, you know what, we need to have the, the public have control of these monopolies. There's nothing we can do about these monopolies. It's big business. Um, it's just the way that it's developed um, is just natural. Um, but put, put public control over those monopolies and uh, then we can run monopolies and run our business institutions for the good of the public. So one was private masters, one was public masters to rule over us. And the third was Woodrow Wilson, and his was really influenced by Brandeis. And his view was, 
no masters. Let's break up monopolies and uh, and regulate those markets, regulate the business practices in the in the markets to return to a more open and free um, society. And um, the 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 fundamental difference, the view of human nature that Brandeis was bringing forward was that society is what we choose to make it. Our markets are political institutions, and we choose the rules, we choose the structures, um, and we choose who gets to play and who doesn't get to play. And that's the view that I have. And I think in a lot of the um, kind of frameworks that uh, that you know you hear about, oh, well, technology always just has these cycles. It's a very Schumpeterian, it's a very inevitableist framework, and it's just it's just not true, right? These are choices that we make, public policy choices that we make to shape how technology develops. And we can't choose physics. We can't choose reality. Um, we can't choose our culture. But we can choose whether everybody gets to play in a market or whether they don't. And patents are, I used patents just because it was about knowledge. But trust me, there were a lot of other antitrust suits involving many other aspects of our, of our culture. But fundamentally, all of this stuff that we're dealing with, it's all made up. All of these rules are made up. Property is a made up thing, right? We choose to. Um, to make these rules up because they serve what we care about uh, better. And we, at least I care about human liberty and the ability to live in a democratic society, which means self-governing. And um, fundamentally, if you don't see it that way, then you're going to say, leave large institutions alone. They're big because they're good. And we cannot, as a self-governing people, touch those institutions because that would be government doing it, and that's too scary. We can't wield that power as a free people. Well, I think we can. I think we can govern ourselves. So that's, I guess, where I would, it's a little bit of an unfair way to put it. But that's my view, um, and that goes back to the philosophy in, in, uh, in really the formation of corporate politics in, in the early 20th century. So Heather, what do you think? Uh, is it the case that we have the power to choose uh, which path we take going forward? Or is it simply the case that some things are cathedrals and some things are bazaars and it's just clear from their nature which one is which? Well, I, I'm, I'm going to point out, I think we have uh, reached another point of consensus between Neil and Matt. Individual liberty is important. It's how you get there. <laughs> it's the, the, that we're actually talking about. Um, one of the things that, that I wanted to comment on, um, so, and, and just as a, a point of background, my background is coding. Has anybody else in here coded much at all? Um, before I got into policy, I was <laughs> I was a, a coder and I realized that I have a lot more fun with these ideas than I do with the day to day. Um, but one of the things that was incredibly clear to me is there's nothing natural about this. This is hard. These are hard problems that you bash your head against for a long time, and then you figure out how to solve it. And it might be the right way to solve it. There may be a better way. Um, but I think um, this comes from you were saying, you know, this has a life of its own. Not your statement, but you were citing somebody. Um, you know, these ideas that these technologies have a life of their own, um, it seems that way from the outside. Absolutely. Like, these are magical technologies that just work like I have this little supercomputer that just works most of the time um, and that that makes it easy to be a little bit intellectually lazy as we think about these things um, there is nothing about the software on this phone that was easy um, there is nothing about the the code behind Firefox that was easy. Um, we are continually iterating it. We're continually fixing bugs. Um, there's nothing kind of inevitable. It certainly, you know, from the inside, there's nothing that feels inevitable about it. We are making hundreds of decisions about design every day, um, which is to say, from a very, you know, from the very complicated level, it, we get to make all of these decisions. And whether whether we're talking about um, you know a software company or a, a, a service or a platform making these decisions, whether we're talking about governments making these decisions or regulators, um, they're decisions and there's nothing in my mind inevitable about them. And how we choose to shape these services uh, is, is the question that we're actually talking about. Do we want Facebook to have this incredible power do we want Facebook to create this incredible service? Both, I, I say yes to both. 
Um, and the idea that you have to choose one doesn't seem quite right to me. Um, and, and it is true. Like, I love Facebook. I am a heavy Facebook user. Am I skeptical of their business at the moment? Yes. Um, th they can both be true at the same time. Uh, and figuring out how to navigate down that path and figure out where Matt and Neil agree uh, I think is is the question of the day. And, and figuring out how to do that, not necessarily, I don't think anybody wants a walled, walled garden. It, the gates are actually Im very important. Can I click on a link on Facebook and get to an external website? Yeah. Um, did they ponder, you know, encapsulating that content on Facebook? Sure. Um, those choices matter and they are not inevitable. Well, uh, in a few minutes, we're going to be going to audience Q&A, but I think I'll let each of our panelists uh, kind of close off the discussion that we've had so far with their reflections. Neil. Uh, well, I'll start with a point of agreement. Uh, society is what we make it. I'm not a historicist. I don't believe that technology is inevitable. Uh, I believe that we all have a responsibility to act uh, justly and, 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 uh, and, and morally. Uh, in how we use technology and how we shape it. Uh, the question is, who is the we that we're talking about? And, and uh, there was an earlier panelist uh, who, who mentioned that, that. The question is, who decides? Uh, it's these, these decisions have to be made. Who decides them? And uh, when I hear Matt say we, I, and when I hear Brandeis say we especially, and when I hear Woodrow Wilson say we, he does not mean we. He means experts. Well, he might mean some of us. I'm still know. hearing them, because that's really weird. Well, yes. <laughs> yes. I, I hear them all the time. Uh, you know, it, you know, they set up. Uh, you know, uh, Wilson Wilson started the uh, the the Federal Trade Commission, so his spirit uh, still haunts me. Um, uh, so you know, when he says we, what he meant was experts. He didn't mean the people. He meant experts who were removed from political pressure were going to make the decisions about how society was going to be shaped. Uh, the history of technology suggests that is not a good way to get progress. Uh, that when you have experts in government designing uh, how the, the, the economy works, uh, it doesn't work well. Um, we have, uh, uh, Tim Wu runs through tons of examples, and while he may be a historicist, I think he's more just observing the patterns of the past, which doesn't make one a historicist, it makes one a scientist. Uh, you're trying to see what, what set of conditions cause something else. Uh, when, he, when he looks uh, at, the, at the past, he looks at things like uh, the way the government regulated radio broadcasting and television in the 60s and uh, the 50s and 60s and 40s, and he calls it a giant disaster because what they ended up doing was shutting out competition. They ended up shutting out uh, interesting voices, and they did that because they were captured by the companies that they were regulating. And so, when we talk about the we, we have to think about how the the structures that we build, where are the incentives. And there's a, there's a long history of uh, if you centralize power in government, that government uh, has, uh, that, that becomes a, a, a place for people to come in and ask for favors. And the history of, of technology has shown that, that that happens over and over. And that when we distribute power out to marketplaces where people can vote with their dollars uh, rather than uh, you know, so the question is what you mentioned voting earlier as a, an indication that we're free. Lots of countries around the country vote, or lots of countries around the world have voting. Uh, they don't have the same sort of freedoms that we have, so it's more than voting. There's something else there as well, and voting with dollars is a, is a good way to indicate what I want, not the only way. Um, and it's a good way to indicate, uh, exercise my choice and to help me, for me to be able to shape the society that I live in. And I would encourage all of us to think about how we can do that at an individual level rather than relying on some Woodrow Wilson appointed expert in Washington to figure that out for us. Matt. Yeah, so I'll just, I'd rather rely on Mark Zuckerberg. Um, that guy in 2006, there's this great book called The Boy Kings. And I just love this story. It came out when Facebook was still cool, so no one read it. But it was this great book by uh, his speechwriter, who's this woman. And she tells this story. In One day in 2006, she got an email. And, uh, and there was from Mark's administrative assistant, who was like, who was like uh, hey, Mark wants, it's his birthday, and he wants, um, for his, for his present, uh, he wants all the women to come into the office wearing a t-shirt with Mark's picture on it. Um, and I love that story because 
you know, we've centralized our global communications network uh, on social media, all three social media networks with more than a billion people on it, and we've give them, given them to, to that guy. So you want to be afraid of experts controlling things. I'm just saying that centralization can happen without, you know, in these private governments as opposed to just public governments. I'm also going to, first I just want to say that that's, I just wrote a book on, on uh, the history of monopoly, and I very much recommend having written a book, but not writing one. Um, uh, that's not what Brandeis thought about, uh, about politics. It's not what Wilson thought about politics. I have this, at the beginning of one of my chapters, is this quote from Wilson where he's just like, and I'm paraphrasing, but he's like, effectively, Lord, save me from experts. They're really annoying. Like, and, you know, you can't, he didn't say that, but he basically said, experts are dangerous. Right, and the point of markets, the point of decentralized markets, the point of breaking up, and and those experts can live in Facebook, and boy, do they have a lot of experts, and they can also live in micromanaging government agencies, and boy, do we have a lot of experts. Oh, and by the way, they keep passing those experts back and forth, right? And that's what he was afraid of, because he fundamentally didn't see a difference between that concentration of power in private institutions or public institutions when they acquire power. That's what he was afraid of, and that's the point is, is to decentralize power, um, not to have sort of the veil of markets, which aren't really markets because they're controlled by one or two players who makes all the decisions, but to have real markets where people are regulated by their competitors. You don't have to have a man in the, in the tower telling everybody what to do. So I, I want to just kind of get to the fundamental distinction between the two of us. Because Neil does believe in freedom, and I believe in freedom, but they're different forms of freedom, and this is very confusing. I believe in freedom from capital. Right? I think if you have a lot of money and a lot of power, that you, sh you if you have a lot of money, if you have a dominant market position, you should not be able, or if you're in government, you know, in, and you're you're very powerful, you should not be able to use that power to dominate others. That's the kind of freedom I believe in: freedom from domination. What Neil believes in, and what he makes the argument for, is freedom to dominate. Don't impinge upon Mark Zuckerberg's right to run his network however he wants, because that would be an impingement on his liberty, on his freedom. And that's right. It is an impingement on his liberty and his freedom. But that is not the kind of freedom that I believe in. And so it is a real difference, and a fundamental philosophical difference. Now, I'll, I'll note one other thing, which is that when Mark Zuckerberg came, and by the way, I'm using Mark Zuckerberg. He's not the only one, but he's just such a great villain. Um, he came to Congress and he testified. And there was a lot of different questions that went at him. But one of the things that I noticed, a couple of senators and congressmen were saying to him, they were like, you're our first line of defense against the bad guys. You got to help us. We got to work together. And I think that's a really scary idea. And he's like, absolutely, I'd love to help you you know, on national security grounds, or I'd love to have, you know, censor things for you. That's scary. That's what we should be afraid of. And if we had decentralized these structures, it, 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 you wouldn't be able to just bring a guy in and then effectively do private censorship the way that we're starting to see happen here and all over the world. So really what we're talking about is private, unaccountable governance, right, which is the model that we're on the, the road towards without freedom, although we'll have freedom for the few at the top who can dominate us, or we will have public democratic governance in which we will all have freedom from domination. All right, let's uh, hear from Heather, and then we'll go to audience Q&A. Yeah, no, I'll keep this um, pretty short. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, this is so much fun to watch, <laughs> I got to say. Um, and, and really, I think that, you know, this, this freedom to, freedom from, you know, freedom for whom question is, is very important. And, you know, I'm, you know, you can class, you know, put me in the bucket. I'm relatively American. I want the government to step in when things are going wrong. Um, and, and right now we're in this weird moment five years ago. You know, I would have, you know, been been running around saying, you know, we just need to let them fix it. They'll figure it out. 
you know, these these platforms that are huge and people love them. They use them because they love them or, you know, their friends are all there or it's just the easiest way to find information or, you know, that's where all of the tweets are. I don't know. Um, <laughs> that one was a little specific. Uh, but, like, <laughs> but, but we're suddenly looking at these companies in a more skeptical way and that's great I want but I want to see the next Facebook I want to see the next Twitter I want to see the next Google because they're going to iterate and they're going to get better um, and so figuring out does that look like open source does that look like interoperability does that look like you know antitrust cases there's a lot of potentially interesting solutions there I'm not going to pretend I have the answer I am not an expert you don't have to be afraid of me um, but you know sitting here and thinking about it if if there hadn't been an antitrust case against Microsoft, Mozilla would not exist right now. At least simply could not have gotten onto the platform because they controlled it. Um, now they had to, to let Firefox and other browsers onto that platform. You know, that, that has led to, you know, wonderful things like the App Store where all of these people get to, you know, I, I can download all of these apps that are not made. Uh, by the phone manufacturer. And, and let me tell you, my first coding job was for a, a cell phone company. It was on Symbian. There was no app store. It was terrible. Um, so the, we are continually iterating these models in ways that are both terrifying and really cool. Um, and so figuring out exactly which direction we want to point um, and how we want to protect that decentralization and the openness of these technologies, these protocols, and these platforms uh, is, is really the policy question that we are wrangling with. All right. I think we're ready for audience questions. Uh, you are invited to specify which panelist you are directing your question to and reminded to be brief and concise. Um, have you got one there? Uh, Daniel Bennett, I uh, big proponent of open standards and a distributed model. But uh, when I loved RSS, um, it failed. Whereas Twitter, which is essentially simplified RSS, succeeded because it was centralized and was able to do things instantaneously. But I, and I'm not sure how it should be regulated. But just today, uh, a whole bunch of far right wing folks have been cast off and the quote freedom of speech doesn't apply to corporations so what do we do when we have something that has to be centralized for technical reasons what do we do regulation do we just let them act as governments what, what is your opinion for those of you who missed the story Louis Farrakhan also got kicked off so it wasn't just right-wing people Uh, well, I can take a crack at that. Um, uh, you know, there are many benefits to closed gardens. Actually, the App Store is not exactly an open market, it's right? In it's in the middle. A, it's in the middle, right? It, but it is. But you know, it's vetted by uh, a company. Uh, unlike when you used to just be able to get any random floppy drive from your or floppy disk from your library and like install something on your computer, that came with a lot of benefits. It came with a lot of risks, too. Uh, and security is one of them. Um, uh, uh, stability is one of them. Uh, vulnerabilities uh, are important. And then just basic things like, uh, you know, Apple is, a f is famously closed on its design because it wants control because it thinks it can provide the best product for, for its consumers. So just a difference in design choices. Um, when, co when companies, you know, companies are not covered by the, they're not regulated by the First Amendment because the First Amendment is a right vis-a-vis -vis the government, um, my right to speak. And that means my right to speak uh, in however I can. And uh, companies don't have an obligation. In fact, they have a right under the First Amendment to choose who speaks on their platforms. And so, uh, so the question there, I mean, the question there is, are we going to tell companies how they should operate their moderation um, and I worry about that too. Matt, Matt raised this point. Like, I worry about the government telling companies or even like soft agreeing with companies on how they should regulate content. That's very concerning. And I think, uh, I think these, these platforms have uh, reputations at stake. They have their customers to, uh, to contend with. And they have to figure out how to make this balance. And you know, if Twitter becomes too hostile, uh, you can block people, uh, for example, who are annoying you. We were talking about this back in the, the green room. So uh, and and so uh, so that's you have choices there. Um, but but the question is like, can people get their message out? 
we live in a time when it's it's easier than ever to get a message out that is uh, not in the majority. It's easier than ever than it has been in all of human history. And so, uh, so the ability of technology to to I think we should keep in perspective when we're talking about people uh, being on or off platforms, uh, the perspective that we live in a pretty rich time for my ability to like take a video of uh, my cat doing something stupid and for millions of people to see it, right? Or to just say something much more important. Uh, and so these platforms provide that for us. Uh, I think we have to be careful about how we dictate to them, or not to say we, how the government dictates to them how they should moderate their platforms. Uh, I think that raises a lot of dangers uh, for the First Amendment. Yeah, so that's a good question. I don't have an answer on Twitter. Um, my general observation is that corporations don't have a First Amendment right. That's just ridiculous. And um, uh, the it's again, it gets back to this freedom, freedom to dominate, freedom from domination, right? Um, what you're talking about is is a, an institution that has some sort of governing force. Right, and I don't actually know how to address that problem, but I think that those decisions should not be made by Jack Dorsey after he's meditated and decided, you know, whatever. That should be a decisions made by the public. But I think behind a lot of the worries over the platforms and these kind of the way that our dialogue is being organized is that you have this radical centralization. I mean, yeah, like nominally it's like easy to put a photo up and stuff, but we have a radical centralization of media that goes back to the 1980s and 90s and, it, and an even more aggressive centralization of advertising money, which finances content creation and used to finance a whole series of, of uh, artistic communities. And what, what that, what's happened is that that's just strip mine the civic leadership that used to exist and used to be the mediating layer around all sorts of kind of annoying extremists. Um, and that's gone, and it's gone because we've chosen to enable like guys in Silicon Valley to control the entire, the two billion people's ways of communicating, or you know, it used to be people in New York, giant media companies or whatever. Um, and, and that's new, that's, that's pretty new. We used to make sure that newspapers in our, our media system was much more localized and decentralized. So I think that that's important to get back to those kinds of values when we're thinking about what kind of public policy levers to pull. But right now the emergency is, um, is that Google and Facebook control 60% of online advertising and that is what is killing speech. I think we have time for question here. one more question. Hi there, uh, thanks guys for the great panel. Um, I guess for me, uh, my question is on um, kind of how I feel the social media market might kind of raise a couple of interesting uh, questions when it comes to monopoly power and antitrust. First is that um, aren't social media companies, you can have like more than one, right? It's not like with your cable company, you're not going to get both Verizon and Comcast and have them both in your house, but you are going to get Twitter and Facebook and whatever else it may be. And then, you know, secondly, for a social media company to be successful, you kind of need to have a large portion of the market. So, um, because you're connecting as many people as you can. And my, my question is for, and I guess this is more for Matt, but for anyone that wants to kind of answer it, um, are you not then left in a situation that as soon as a social media company does what it's meant to, which is connect as many people as possible, it automatically triggers um, you know, an antitrust concern that basically a successful social media company is there for one that needs to be broken up? So there are lots of ways to handle uh, monopolization, but w one example of what to do is in 2001, the AOL Time Warner merger, one of the conditions the FCC put on AOL was you have to open up instant messenger for interoperability. And you saw a lot of companies coming in and enabling you know, interoperability. And that's actually something that happened in 1913 with AT&T's long lines business. So interoperability is a mechanism to, uh, to address monopolization problems. There's a whole bunch of ways that you can, that you can deal with the problem. But the, the other answer is that if you do, um, the tr one of the traditional American models for how to handle communication networks is that if you do dominate or own a layer of a communication network, you can't do anything else. You can't vertically integrate into something else. Um, there have also been horizontal restraints. So like, sure, Facebook might have some economies of scale, although you can deal with that with interoperability. But why should Facebook also own Instagram and WhatsApp? There's no economies of scale there. That's just getting pricing power over 
social media advertising. So there's lots of different ways to, to handle it. It doesn't necessarily, you don't necessarily need to break everything up all the time. Although, as I was saying to Neil, my, my philosophy is simple. Whenever there's a problem, just break things up. Um, there, are, there are lots of ways to deal with this fair, um, reasonable, and non-discriminatory treatment, neutrality, these kinds of other, other principles that you can apply to network systems. Well, uh, I think we're going to have to break things up here, uh, break up this panel, um, but not because it went badly, because it went very well, and I'd like to thank all three of them. <laughs> <laughs>